Hello friends, followers and channel members, welcome back to another video here in Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 and in our video today I'm going to be discussing the departure brief that we do before every flight. Now this was something that I, I got asked about recently via a comment on another video and somebody asked is it possible to perhaps do a video detailing what it is we're looking for and how to do a comprehensive and realistic departure brief prior to a flight so I thought that would be a great topic for this video today so in this video we're going to look at preparing for a real ops flight now whenever I do a real ops flight here on the channel this is exactly what we do with regards to the departure brief which is why we can spend a good 45 minutes on the ground before we get going everywhere in reality that is exactly how it is now, low-cost carriers usually have a very short turnaround time, only something like 30 minutes. So the departure briefs are usually quick, concise, but they still contain all the information both pilots will need in order to understand exactly how the flight is going to be prepped, what to expect en route, and what to expect when we land as well. This video focuses purely on the departure brief and I will look at doing another video in the future with regards to an arrival brief so hopefully this will take you through everything that I'm thinking and everything I'm working through when we load into a live stream now obviously a video such as this you may have questions so please do feel free to leave a comment down below and I'll try and get back to you as quick as I can and clear anything up in case there's anything else you want help with. So at the start of every live stream we do when it's a real ops flight this is the screen that's usually on display and this is to basically mimic the pilot's briefing room. Pilots tend to arrive at the airport about an hour or so before the departure. They go into the briefing room and get all of the things that they need. The operational flight plan, information on the weather, any of course uh, information from their uh, airline and uh, their operators etc. Everything they need to conduct the safe flight. And we do something then very similar here. So first of all let's have a look at at the operational flight plan that's the first thing that I do so let's grab that and today I'm doing a very short flight from Newquay up to Manchester yes this is a real world EasyJet flight um, not a very long one as we can see it's only 42 minutes long uh, but it takes place usually just in the summer months and it's a great little flight if anyone fancies checking this out so here we go operational flight plan this is the first thing that I'm going through. I'm looking at the payload, so we've got about 15 tons there, just over 15,000 kilograms. Uh, I'm looking at our takeoff weight, so we can see that it's around 63.8 tons rounded up, which as I can see already is below our maximum landing weight. So in the back of my mind, I'm thinking um, we're not that heavy today. If I needed to get back in quickly somewhere, we're not going to be overweight for our landing. Now, generally that is because because on today's flight it's a very short flight we're not going to be taking very much fuel so on a longer flight you'd probably expect to see the takeoff weight higher than the maximum landing weight but as it is not today uh, next thing I'm looking at is the underload so that's basically showing me how far off our uh, maximum zero fuel weight we are so we're about a couple of tons underloaded today as well the alternate for today's flight quite bizarrely has come up as uh, London Heathrow that of course would not be like that in real life but uh, we'll leave that as uh, Heathrow for now uh, the cost index the cruise flight level and um, we can quickly check out the tropopause as well we're not going to be uh, above the tropopause so the some weather that we're going to have to take into consideration. Uh, the trip wind, we've got a nice tailwind. And then the next thing that I'm looking at, I've already mentioned how long the flight is today, and then the shear rate. Now, if this starts to get above eight, then start to take notice of it. A shear rate above eight means that it might be a little bit bumpy at whatever waypoint it tells us. It tells us here, though, the maximum shear rate is only 1.4, so we're in for a very clear calm day today and the top of climb is where that maximum shear rate is estimated to be. The operational flight plan then we can obviously get the expected runway for departure and arrival and everything else on route things like the standard instrument departure here in Newquay there isn't one though so it's takeoff and direct to EPAS and then the arrival at Manchester is this 
Axis 1 mic arrival for 05 right. Not a runway I often land at, but uh, that would be quite nice today. Next, then, I'm going to look down at the fuel figures. So we have got close to 5,000 kilograms of planned block fuel, or plug fuel for short. And with that, five tons of fuel, I'm now looking at the CNR. CNR is the company normal reserve, which basically means that if we start to get towards 2.6 tons of fuel left in the tanks, well, that's the point where I need to decide, am I going to head to my alternate, which in this case is nominated as London Heathrow, or am I going to commit to Manchester? Now, it's a beautiful day here today in the UK, so realistically, diversions are probably not going to happen. Uh, but if the weather was really, really rubbish up at Manchester, uh, if there was thunderstorms over the field, for example, and we were sat in a holding pattern, and I saw my fuel getting to down down to around three tons, well, then I'd start to think, well, I've not got long before I've got to commit to either sitting here at Manchester, hoping the weather's going to clear, or am I going to get down to uh, London Heathrow, assuming the weather at London Heathrow, of course, was fine. But whilst we're sat in the holding button, we'd be discussing what uh, what our various options are. Always good to have a couple of outs uh, up our sleeves. But yeah, 2.6 tons is the magic number. Once we drop below this, then we're pretty much committed to getting in to Manchester. So that's always worth noting as uh, as well. So the next thing I'm looking at as I'm going down is the uh, the Mora, which is basically just checking out these numbers here. So that's 3,700 feet, 4,500 feet, 3,900 feet, and that's the minimum off route altitude. And basically the reason I check this is because if I see anything above uh, 100 on here, which is 10,000 feet, I know um, that if we had a depressurization issue, then I couldn't just get the aircraft down without thinking carefully about where we were because there could be some terrain around. For example, if we were flying over the Alps today, then we'd see that that would come above um, 100, uh, 100, so 10,000 feet, at which point I would make a little note um, how far time-wise into the flight that would be. So I know that in, say, for example, maybe if it was half an hour, this was over 100, half an hour flight time. I know that between half an hour and 45 minutes um, for that 15 minute interval, I've got terrain underneath me. So I need to be aware of what I would do and where I would go if we needed to uh, make an emergency descent for whatever reason. So on a flight like this today, Nuki up to Manchester, there's not really any terrain to worry about, and a quick scan down con uh, confirms that. The next thing then, this page here, I have a look at the weather. Now, this shows the worst case scenario weather um, with regards to the forecast and things coming up. It's a gorgeous day today, and I usually refer to this as all the nines. So this is the ceiling, this is the visibility. Ceiling is 10,000 feet, or basically no clouds. Um, and the visibility, of course, is... Uh, 10 kilometers or more. Also tells you the different kinds of approaches that we've got to expect at our various uh, destinations and alternates, for example. And I also have a quick look at the crosswind component as well to see if any of those numbers jump out at me, but I like to see this. So the only thing there is you've got Birmingham, visibility is down to seven kilometers, but that's still cat one. So basically I'm looking at this and thinking weather is good everywhere. So I'm not gonna be scratching my head wondering where to go if something goes wrong. So the next thing I'm looking at then is the weather brief. We'll have a quick look here. This is Manchester. There we go. No clouds detected. Uh, winds are five knots, zero seven zero five knots, light and variable. Um, no significant changes, so that's good as well. Have a quick look at the forecast as well. We can see there was a uh, potential for a few showers this morning. Um, but again, just looking at this, the visibility is never going to drop really below seven kilometers. So. Am I going to be worried about getting into Manchester today? Probably not. The weather isn't going to cause us to uh, be held up or have to start thinking about diverting or anything like that. So that's going to be uh, that's going to be fine. If the weather is looking a bit iffy at Manchester, you know, there's thunderstorms in the forecast. I'll be thinking about taking extra fuel because we might end up holding or having to divert. Wind shear reported, potential for a go around. So maybe throw a bit of extra fuel on for that. If you're heading to a really busy airport, for example, like London Heathrow, or you're flying on the Vatsim network and there is a big event on, then I'm thinking we need extra fuel for traffic as well. But this is a great starting point to think about how much extra fuel you're going to want to throw on top of that plug fuel. Um, 
So, yeah, I'd quickly skirt down the forecasts for uh, any of the alternate airports if we hadn't got all the nines earlier on in the flight plan. But I'm quite happy to skip over that because the weather's looking good. Just the flight route, so I've got a bit of situational awareness knowing where we are, uh, where we're going. We've then got the uh, SIGMET chart, so any significant weather to worry about? Nothing today. We can see there is a uh, bit of icing and a turbulence reported out over the uh, Atlantic, but that's not going to concern us to uh, today. Uh, this is the high weather forecast, uh, so you'll quite often see that both uh, the lower level forecast, uh, sorry, that's the map, isn't it? This is the lower level forecast, that's the higher weather forecast. You can see confirming down here. Usually you'll find just a little bit of difference if there's only uh, low level uh, weather to worry about. That's obviously not shown on the higher page. But then we've got the wind page as well, just confirming the winds. We've got a nice tailwind as we saw earlier. And then we've got the side profile down at the bottom. So that would also just confirm any uh, terrain that uh, you'd need to uh, not be concerned about, but just be aware about. So after I've done that then, let's have a look at the NOTAMs, that's the next thing to go through. So a quick look here shows that a lot of the NOTAMs sadly don't really apply to flight simulation. Things like an unlit crane, we're not going to see that in uh, in the scenery. Um, the new key airport activation aerodrome hours, again, doesn't really matter does it in, uh, in the simulator. This however is worth picking up. So the air starter is only available for an Embraer 145. So let's say for example we were doing um, the uh, the other uh, return flights. If we were doing Manchester to Newquay and our aircraft today had got a in-op APU for example, well then we'd be, um, we, we might be a little bit stuck because once we got to new key, how am I going to start the engines if there's no air starter uh, available? Um, so it's worth just bringing that into uh, the brief, but thankfully my aircraft's working today, so that makes, uh, that makes no odds to us. I'm going to have a quick look at Manchester um, NOTAMs as well. Uh, let's have a quick look. So dual runway, that's fine. Uh, other times, single runway, mixed mode operations are in force uh, again. So now this is uh, this is quite interesting. Again, just looking at the time, it doesn't make any difference to us today because we're not going to be arriving overnight. Uh, but zero five left and two three right, which is the main runway at Manchester, that's going to be closed overnight, uh, which means that we'd be using zero five right and two three left. Two three left, I just know from experience, is uh, a different runway to land on because it doesn't have an ILS. There's only an ILS approach available there and you can see that that actually that work in progress would actually be cancelled in the event of low visibility procedures because you couldn't get an ILS approach in onto runway uh, 23 left so they would keep 23 right open for that so it's worth just skirting the no times it depends how much detail you want to go into on the simulator really but um, yeah that's interesting uh, new 23 left intersections declared again this is more for if we were taking off at Manchester but it's always worth looking particularly if we're going to be doing a return flight as uh, as well uh, and then there's of course the notams for all of the alternates down here as well that's the kind of stuff that might be worth reading once you're uh, in cruise that said it's not a long cruise time today so um, maybe things to read if we end up having to divert and get thrown into a hold somewhere and of course in real life the guy sat next to you or the girl will be able to help you out as well with all of that stuff uh, right, so now, finally, I've been thinking, well, what extra fuel should we take? So we've had a look at the weather. It's pretty good all the way around. Manchester's not that much of a busy airport, so I don't expect to have to hold for half an hour. Um, so I'm going to try and justify any extra fuel. Five tons is plug fuel. I could probably take plug fuel. I know I will be absolutely fine, particularly when my alternate is somewhere like London Heathrow, which is you know, it's quite a distance away, to be honest. If I had to divert at Manchester for whatever reason, I'd probably be looking at Birmingham. Liverpool, of course, is very close. Leeds as well, Leeds Bradford. Um, so I think plug fuel today uh, would be absolutely fine. So I would be happy to take five tons. So that's basically my brief done uh, going through the operational flight plan. The next thing I would do then is I'd bring up the charts. So I know today we're parked stand 20 here at... Um, new key uh, and then I would just check what runway is we're departing on I can't remember it was runway 12 so runway 12 um, I don't know the airport too well so let's just have a quick look at uh, how we're gonna get to that so looks like we'd push back and then we're taxiing out uh, north uh, to holding point alpha one 
It's a relatively short taxi, so would I be doing a single engine taxi? No, probably not. I don't really have time and there's not really much traffic here at Newquay, so um, I'll um, forget the idea of a single engine taxi. Don't need to, uh, don't need to do that. Um, and then the other thing is perhaps just have a look at the arrival chart for Newquay. Obviously we're departing it, but particularly on the Jefferson charts, um, the arrival charts seem to always show more information with regards to NAVAID. So we've got the Newquay NDB. We can see a little bit of terrain there as well. For some reason, the um, the standard instrument departure charts, of which Newquay doesn't actually have any, um, but it doesn't show as much detail as the arrival chart. So always worth having a quick look at an arrival chart for your departing airport just for situational awareness and also gives you more information on the nav aids you can program into the radnav page here in the airbus as well okay so happy then with all of that we would then jump into our aircraft so let's just um, let's just have a look at doing that now here we are. And then we go through the usual things um, in terms of just checking uh, everything's all uh, all set up. We'd then go set up the box, all that stuff. And then we'd do the full departure brief. So everything in the uh, briefing room was basically gathering the information that we need. But then we do the departure brief. And that's what I do with you guys listening so you know exactly what I'm going to do, uh, when I expect to do it, that kind of thing. And the departure brief usually starts with what we call the want brief, W-A-N-T. That is W for weather, A for aircraft, N for no times, T for threats. So starting with the weather, we've already seen that the weather here in New Key is absolutely fine. Uh, if I need to, I can just have this on uh, on stand as well so we can see it. Uh, in fact, where's that gone? Yeah, so we just say, uh, yeah, Heathrow, uh, sorry, Heathrow, New Key weather uh, is uh, 130 at 14. So, you know, that's a decent, uh, that's a bit of a decent headwind going down, but it's cab okay. q and is 1016. That's fine. Also make sure we've got that all set up, which we have. So that's, uh, that's good. Um, weather then en route, we discuss that. There's no weather en route today, so that's great. Weather for our arrival, we then discuss that. We've already seen it's light winds, um, 0705, so a little bit of wind from the right as we're coming into land. No clouds detected and no significant changes, so that again is all absolutely fine. Um, the next thing then is the aircraft in the want brief. The aircraft, we basically just say, right, what aircraft are we in and what's wrong with it? Well, <laughs> the only thing wrong with the, the Phoenix A320 aircraft here in Microsoft Flight Simulator is the in-op weather radar isn't it yeah this uh, it doesn't work so quite often you'll uh, you'll hear me say we're in the aircraft a320 uh cfm engines and the only thing in the tech log is the weather radar because it doesn't work uh n then in the one brief for no tams we've been through the no tams there's nothing that is uh, going to affect us here as long as we've got an operational apu and then threats to be aware of okay so new key doesn't have too many threats uh only things that is worth bringing in is it's a very short taxi so you know we've got lots to do in a short time so don't rush anything you've not got you know um, a couple of kilometers of taxi to do so uh, it's uh, make sure we're prepared if we need to stop the aircraft and uh, get uh, don't let the aircraft get ahead of us so to speak so it's a short taxi um, there's um, perhaps if we are flying on the VATSIM network, but there's no air traffic controllers here, then that's a little bit of a threat because it's sort of uncontrolled airspace, isn't it? So listening out for other aircraft and making good communication calls, that kind of thing. Uh, if you've not flown for a while, you could be a threat. You, I've said this before, I've recently come back off holiday. I hadn't uh, flown for a couple of weeks. So I was a threat because, uh, you know, a little bit, uh, little bit rusty. So that's uh, a perfectly adequate uh, statement to make. Um, but other than that, that's uh, that's pretty much it. There's no real terrain here in Newquay. There's this little thing uh, out here, which perhaps, you know, if we lost an engine for whatever reason, then um, that could potentially be a threat. If We're not actually that heavy today, of course, so I don't see it being an issue being able to climb above uh, 1,286 feet, but it is straight out on the approach, so it's worth perhaps just noting that there as well. So once I've done uh, all of that, I then look at briefing all the taxi procedures and the departure. So the taxi procedure here 
we're a stand 20 we're going to push back we're going to face north uh, on uh, alpha we'll then uh, taxi out on alpha hold alpha one and we're doing a full length departure today and then once we are uh, out we have a look at our departure now remember new key doesn't have any standard instrument departure so literally we're taking off and then when we're happy uh, we're going left turn direct to uh, epas or however you want to pronounce that uh, so how I would fly that is uh, we'll depart straight out, obviously gear up, uh, we'll um, get above MSA, which again MSA is found on the uh, arrival chart, it should also be found on the departure chart, but there aren't any here in Nuki. Uh, so once we get to 3000 feet we'll be above MSA, we'll make a left hand turn then, and it will uh, take us direct to our, uh, our first waypoint. There's no speed restrictions, so I can clean up the configuration on schedule. You know, we can retract the flaps once we're past S speed, that kind of thing. Um, and then we're, um, we're all good to uh, carry on to our uh, destination with that uh, left turn. So then the other thing that we would brief is the engine out procedure. Now, as you'll know, if you uh, watch this channel regularly, uh, the engine out procedure is uh, shown in SimSmart. SimSmart, an A320 Neo performance calculator. But even when I'm flying the Phoenix, I still use this because we get thrust reduction, acceleration, altitudes, the engine out, acceleration, altitude, and our uh, engine out procedure down here. Now, as you can see here, the engine out procedure for Nuki is non-standard. That basically means that before you can level off to accelerate away after you've lost an engine, you need to complete a turn. And that makes sense because we've already seen from the chart that there was a bit of terrain, wasn't there? A little hill with a mast on, on the departure straight out on the runway we're taking today. Uh, so we just quickly brief this as well. So the engine out procedure here is non-standard. So at two and a half miles from India November Echo Whiskey, which if we just check on the chart, India November Echo Whiskey, that is the ILS DME. So in this case, this might be one of those times when I would have the landing system turned on for our departure. So I've got two and a half miles shown down here. I know that when we've reached that two and a half mile point, we're going to make a right turn to heading 270. That basically steers us away from the terrain that we spoke about. Then at 1900 feet and after completing that turn, it's a right turn back to the Nuki NDB, which is basically on the field. So we brief that as, um, as well. Once that's all been done, then the only thing left to do really is just to go through the box and make sure that everything that we've briefed is exactly what we've got in here. Now, you can either brief it whilst going through the box, but I prefer just to go through everything um, in sort of the brief with you guys on live stream. And then just once we've done that, show you that the box is indeed set up for everything we've discussed. So in this case, just confirm, yep, yeah, it's runway uh, one, two, we're departing from straight out. And then it's going to be a direct to our first waypoint. We said we'll do that once reaching, I would say, 3000 feet. Um, Radnav page is tuned to the NQY NDB. We've got that in there. Progress page, then we'll check. We're going to plan to cruise at 31 1,000 feet. Optimum is 35 and it's well below recommended max so we can get straight up to our cruising altitude. We don't need to uh, burn fuel before uh, we can get there because we're not really heavy today. On to our performance then and there we confirm V-speed is 134, 134, 136, transition altitude 3,000 feet. Thrust direction acceleration altitudes are all correct. Clean speed is 213. We're doing a flaps one departure today and flexing at 66. Our takeoff weight is going to be 64 tons so we're already below our maximum landing weight in the event of uh, an immediate return and the second flight plan has the engine out procedure in which is always worth just checking on the navigation display that that looks like something sensible so yeah straight out right hand turn and then we are entering the hold at the NDB and we've got the arrival back in as well. You'll also see the go around track shown as well. So it uh, can be a little bit confusing, but there you can see it nice and uh, clear if I zoom in a little bit. So that's it. That is the full brief done. And then we are ready to go. 
So guys, I really hope that has been useful for you. As I said earlier, it's the kind of video which might leave a few unanswered questions. So if you do have anything you want to ask, then please do leave a comment down below. And as I said, I'll get back to you, uh, hopefully to try and answer as soon as possible. Thank you so much for watching. And I do hope you have found this video useful. If you have, then please do hit the like button. And of course, you can also now support the channel further if you wish via Super Thanks. If you're new to the channel, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so you don't miss any future videos and of course, our live streamed flights. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you all again in the next one. Bye bye for now.